Welcome to Think Over Here, the show where we pop all over the world and explore cultures, stories, and history. Today we are thinking over in Turkey. Specifically, we are talking about the Maiden's Tower, or I'm going to kill this pronunciation and I apologize in advance, Kiz Kulisi. So this tower has a lot of stories and legends associated with it. And the common thread in many of these stories of the Maiden's Tower is that the stories center around a girl being locked up in the tower for various reasons, and hence the name Maiden's Tower. Now, I am not an expert in Turkish culture. I am definitely stepping outside my realm of expertise. And so I want to be very upfront. I want to apologize for any mistakes that I make in pronunciation, history, culture, etc. So please correct me as needed. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to appropriate any culture or anything like that. I want to... I'm simply a person who loves learning about culture and I want to share what I learned. And so if I make a mistake, please (laughs) let me know. Because yeah, I mean, we're all learning together. And that's how we learn is by researching, talking and communicating and helping each other out. So I appreciate your help and I'm excited to share what I have learned about this amazing place, uh, the Maiden's Tower. And so today I want to share a couple stories that take place at Kiz Kulisi, the Maiden's Tower that's located in Istanbul, Turkey. And don't worry, the stories will very clearly demonstrate why the tower is called the Maiden's Tower. First, let's talk about what the tower looks like. The tower is a beautiful tower. It looks like a lighthouse, just like a small little lighthouse that's got all dolled up, ready to go to the prom or something. And it is built on a small rocky unit in the Bosphorus Strait near the Black Sea, located in Istanbul. And specifically, it's located in the suburb region of Istanbul known as Uskudar. And no one really knows when the Maiden's Tower was first built. Uh, The first records of the tower are from 410 BC. So we're talking a long time ago. So, of course, over that time, it has been lots of different buildings, has looked very different, has been destroyed, rebuilt, re, uh, refurnished, the whole thing. And the tower, just a few examples, has been used as a tomb. It's been used as a checkpoint for customs. It's been used for defense. This is a watchtower. It's commonly used as a lighthouse and has even been used as a quarantine area. And it makes sense that it's been used for so many purposes throughout its history because it is just located out in the middle of the water, away from the land. So it's just far enough that the water can protect it, that it is a very recognizable building out in the middle of the strait. But it's also close close enough to land that it's readily accessible. It's really just in the perfect spot, and if you go and look at images of it, you can just see it's uh, just really pretty just out there. Just a beautiful lighthouse tower just looks like it's rising straight out of the water. And currently, it is being used as a restaurant. So if you go to Istanbul, you can get a boat and ferry yourself over to the island and have a wonderful meal in the restaurant as you look out cross the coastline and see the just a beautiful view of the water in the city. So I've never been out there, but I would love to go there sometime. <laughs> and so, so really anything that is over a thousand years old and is located in a major city such as Istanbul and is in a pretty special location, like being in the middle of the water, is going to have some stories and legends associated with it. And Istanbul in particular, you have to think about all of its history with the Byzantine Empire, how it used to be Constantinople, how it's changed, how you have the Ottoman Empire coming in here. You have this wonderful mixing of Christianity and um, Muslim religions. So it's going to have a lot of stories and a lot of history. So this tower has a lot of stories and legends associated with it. And the common thread in many of these stories of the Maiden's Tower is that the stories center around a girl 
being locked up in the tower for various reasons, and hence the name Maiden's Tower. Now, it should be pretty common sense that you shouldn't lock innocent girls up in towers. I hope that is clear to everybody. I really do. And really, honestly, you shouldn't lock any innocent person in a tower, really. Let's be honest. Because people aren't objects, people aren't property. They should have their own personal freedoms. And so these stories are going to demonstrate just what can happen and why you shouldn't keep girls stowed away in an island tower. So let's go to our first story. It is the 8th century, and I know that won't mean a lot for people other than that was a long time ago, but this is the time period in which iron horseshoes begin to start to be commonly used. So there you go, a long time ago. And this is when the Ottomans and the Byzantine Empire were at war. And so a little bit of history uh, for that. Now, the Byzantine Empire, if you remember from history class, was the Christian remnant of the Roman Empire that was based in Constantinople, which is now modern-day Istanbul. And the Ottomans, they were mainly these Arab Muslims, and because... Turkey is right there on the border of Europe and Asia. There is a lot of mixing, a lot of conflict uh, between the Byzantines and the Ottomans. And so here we are we have in this conflict and enter in one Batal Ghazi. And again, I apologize if I say his name incorrectly, Batal Ghazi. And he is a semi-historical Muslim fighter. So a lot of his stories are based on real Muslim generals from this time period that have, but there's also been some additional uh, legendary tales thrown into the mix. And Patal Ghazi, he's fighting against the Byzantine emperor, Leon. And Batal, Batal Ghazi, he's a man's man. He's strong, brave, dashing, smart romantic. He's got it all. In fact, he is the focus of epic poems, and modern day, he is the star in many movies. So Batal Ghazi is currently laying siege on the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople, and specifically its suburb Uskadar, where the Maiden's Tower is located. And so again, we have the Ottomans, with their superhero, Batal Ghazi, laying siege to the Christian Byzantine Empire. Get it? Got it? Good. So now, as sieges take a while, Batal Ghazi, during this time, was able to find, meet, and fall in love with the governor of Uskatar's beautiful daughter. And better yet, she too fell in love with him. The feelings were mutual. And I would go deeper into their love story, but it would probably make you jealous, as their love story puts all other love stories to shame. Wink, wink. And so the governor, fearing that his daughter would go and run off with Batal Ghazi, he locked her in the Maiden's Tower, along with his finest treasures. And for added protection, he placed ships all around the tower to stop any intruders, and he positioned, of course, his armed guards inside of the tower. So really, at this point, it seemed impossible for any for anyone, even Batal Ghazi, remember, the man's man, to enter the tower and take away the girl and the treasures. But the governor underestimated Batal Ghazi, as Batal Ghazi was not going to let some ships, no, and he was not going to let a heavily fortified island tower stop him from being with his true love. And so, in the middle of the night, dead quiet, except for maybe some crickets or something, Batal Ghazi rowed a boat out to the island tower quietly sneaking past the warships. He slipped into the tower, and silently he took out each of the guards and loaded the boat up with all the treasures of the governor. And more importantly, 
he was able to free his lover and bring her with him. And then as the two lovers were escaping the tower, Batal Ghazi set fire to the warships and they rode back to land. Guess Batal Ghazi was a showman and practical. And when they finally got back to the shore, Batal placed the princess on his charger warhorse and together they rode off into the night where they were later married. And so we see that the governor who tried to keep his daughter by locking her away in a tower ultimately, in the end, lost his daughter. And when the governor found out that his daughter was gone, he demanded his soldiers to tell him where she was. But the soldiers could only respond, He who rides the horse has already passed Uskadar. And that there was no way that they were going to be able to catch up to them. And so this phrase, He who rides the horse has already passed Uskadar, is apparently still used in Turkey and is similar to the phrase, the horse is out of the barn, meaning that which is lost is lost for good. It is gone out of there. And so we see that locking a girl in the maiden's tower to try to keep her away from her true love will only result in the girl escaping with her lover along with your treasure and you'll lose a lot of soldiers and your warships. So maybe it's better to Help your daughters instead of locking them up. Just a word to the wise. But you know, honestly, I think the soldiers really could have tried harder to catch Batal Ghazi. I mean, the Maiden's Tower is located in Uskadar. And so the farthest that Batal Ghazi could have gone out is about three miles or so. So I think they I think the soldiers could have put up a little bit more effort, to be honest. But Again, I can't judge the soldiers because the farthest that I've ever ridden a horse is like maybe 50 yards. So who am I to judge? And uh, so with that, let's hop into our second story about the second girl who found herself locked in the Maiden's Tower. Because the governor's daughter was not the only girl to ever be locked in there. But there was a Byzantine emperor who also had a very beautiful daughter. And she was so very beautiful, as all people are beautiful, as she had found a way to find and love beauty in her body. And so, anyway, this emperor loved his daughter very much. And so what he did is he called all the finest scholars and oracles to teach her, so that she would become an educated and fine lady. However, one of the oracles had a grim prophecy, for he said that before the girl's 18th birthday, she would be bitten by a venomous snake and die. Now, none of the other oracles received this prophecy. It was only the one. But the emperor feared the words of that one. And so, fearing for his daughter's life, the emperor had to find a way to prevent her from being bitten by a snake. And since moving to Ireland, where there are no snakes, was out of the question, he decided to lock her away in the maiden's tower and cut her off completely from the rest of the world. And so there in her tower, surrounded by water in the strait, it would be impossible for a snake to bite her. So that's what happened. They moved the girl to the tower, and there she stayed for years and years. Away from the world, all she could do was watch the shoreline and watch the sun rise and set each day. So there she waited and waited, waiting, counting the days until her 18th birthday, when she would finally be freed from her safe prison and she could finally again meet another person. Well, the years passed, and on the night before her 18th birthday, her father, the emperor, sent her a basket filled with delicious grapes as a gift to celebrate the end of the ominous prophecy. Unfortunately, there was an unexpected traveler in that basket of grapes. As a snake had slithered into the basket when no one was looking. And so when the basket arrived at the tower, and the girl excitedly took the basket and reached for a lovely clump of purple grapes, quick as lightning, the snake sunk its fangs into the arm of the girl. And in shock, the girl dropped the basket to the floor. And in her mind, 
She felt the excitement of leaving the tower the very next day pale and fade away as her face paled as the venom seeped through her blood. And then, just like the basket, she dropped to the floor, dead. And the snake slithered away. Well, the worst thing had happened. The prophecy had come to pass. The emperor grieved the loss of his daughter, and the emperor also grieved the loss of those 18 years of her life that she spent locked away in that tower. And the emperor was angry at the snake, and he still feared the snake, and he was worried that the snake would return and devour the flesh of the, of the poor girl. And so he decided to have a fine and beautiful iron coffin made to protect the girl's body. And not only that, he placed the coffin high up on the doors of the magnificent cathedral, Hagia Sophia, where her body would be safe. But unfortunately... It's believed that those measures did not stop the snake. For if you travel to Istanbul and go to the Hagia Sophia and go to the door where the iron coffin is laid above it, you can see two small holes in the coffin, evidence that the snake supposedly had penetrated the defenses placed by the emperor a second time. So what can we take away from these stories? Well, we learned that Byzantine emperors and governors were pretty bad at protecting things first off. But we also see that sometimes the tighter we cling to something, the farther it slips away from us. Similarly, the Byzantine Empire slipped away from Turkey. Constantinople slipped away, becoming Istanbul. And funnily enough, Turkey is located on the Anatolian geologic fault system. And thus, all of Turkey is slipping and sliding away. I mean, you can even see this on Google Earth. If you go and look at the satellite imagery, it looks like Turkey is being squeezed into the Mediterranean Sea, away from Asia. Because in many ways, it is. So one may think that it is simply Turkey, and specifically the Maiden's Tower, that is prone to things slipping away. But I don't think so. I think that things slipping away and loss are key components of our universe and the human experience. As we grasp tightly around things for fear of losing them, we can strangle, smother, we can bruise, we can break that very thing that we want to protect in our tight grasp, just like that poor princess who spent her whole life locked away in a tower. In nature, things grow, things change, things move on. And sometimes the best thing to do is to simply enjoy what we have in that moment. Enjoy it in the present. And when it is time in the future to let that thing go, accept that. We can still love and protect things. But the stories of the Maiden's Tower reminds us that we should not smother or lock away the things we love to the point of damaging those things. Rather, we need to appreciate the present and be ready to let things go when the time comes. And I felt this in my own life, and really I felt it multiple times, every time that school was about to begin and summer vacation was about to end. Right there at the end of July and August, I knew that my precious summer vacation was rapidly coming to a close. And I felt this desire, this need to squeeze out every moment of fun that I could for my summer vacation before I had to go back to school and do math and reading. But I learned that as I focused too hard on trying to make the most out of my summer vacation and squeeze every ounce of fun that I could, I lost the very essence of summer vacation. I lost the carefree pace, the fun nature of summer. And soon <laughs> my summer vacation felt like a chore or a job as I was planning out all my days and all the fun activities that I wanted to do. And so thankfully I quickly learned that the best way to enjoy a summer vacation is simply to enjoy it and accept that the beginning of the school year will come when it comes. But often, the things that we want to protect and the things that we want to love and enjoy are more important than the summer vacation. The things we want to protect, that we want to keep, that we want to grasp tightly to, are people. 
or relationships. So how do we find this balance of protecting the things we love, the people that we love, while accepting that these things can change, that they can be lost, that people may find new interests? Or how do we find that balance of caring for the things we love without suffocating them? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Okay, and so now before we wrapped up, it's time to go to the question bowl. So let's reach in here, find a question. Okay, here we go. What is your favorite fruit? Well, I have a lot of favorite fruits. I really like fruit in general. But the one that... Uh, comes to mind. I don't know if it's my favorite fruit, but it's the one that I have a story about, so I'll share that. It's got to be, and it's a good one, it's the pomelo or pomelo. I'm not quite sure how you say it, but it's like a giant green grapefruit. And I remember the first time that I had this, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to eat it, and so I got it. And the on the pomelo or pomelo, it has this really thick rind. It's almost like a like a pillow. It's so thick. And so you just start tearing into this green rind. And it's just so fluffy. And I wasn't sure if that was the part you're supposed to eat or the actual flesh of the fruit. So I remember trying to take a bite out of the rind. And I quickly learned that even though it was soft and fluffy like a pillow, it was very bitter. Uh, but, you know, I quickly learned to go into the fruit of it, and it was just uh, really fun. Just and you know, It's, it's kind of like an orange and a grapefruit mixed together. It's sweeter than a grapefruit, more tart than an orange, and it's just big. And so there you go. That's, pro- that's my, uh, I guess that's my favorite fruit story. Uh, but if I, yeah, and if I had to say a favorite fruit, I mean, I'm thinking the watermelon. That's actually on my, t- on my to-do list is I want to try a Bradford watermelon. I heard about those on a pat podcast this past week. And I'm really excited to try one of those. But the only way to get them is to drive to South Carolina and uh, pre-order them. Uh, and so I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But one day, the Bradford melon will be mine. <laughs> so there you go. Favorite fruit. Um, And uh, so next time, I'm planning on sharing some cultural stories that surround the Hagia Sophia. We mentioned that today with the coffin above the door. And uh, especially since the Hagia Sophia is recently in the news as it's being converted into a mosque. And don't worry, we'll talk about that next time. And uh, along with the mystery of the Hagia Sophia's sweating column. And yes, you heard that correctly. There is a column that sweats. And so get excited for that next time on Think Over Here, and I'll see you there. Ciao.